Cocoa originated from the Amazon River Basin in Central and South America and has been widely planted there since over 500 years ago. The natural habitat of cocoa is in the lower canopies of tropical rainforests, where light intensity is low, air humidity is high, and the temperature differences between night and day, as well as months in the years, are low. Cocoa growing countries all lie within 15 degrees latitude north and south. In Vietnam, Cocoa is mostly planted in the Mekong Delta, western highlands and coastal provinces of the central regions. Off the cocoa pod, the main parts to get used are the beans with a fat content taking up 50 to 60 percent mass of the beans. Fermented beans, after roasted, are grinded in heated conditions from 50 to 60 degrees Celsius into a brown, viscous liquid called cocoa liquor. At this temperature, the mass is in liquid form. In normal conditions, however, the cocoa liquor solidifies into a solid mass. When cocoa liquor is pressed, we separate cocoa butter and cocoa cake. Grinding the cocoa cake gives us cocoa powder. Cocoa liquor, cocoa powder, and cocoa butter are the main ingredients for the food and confectionery industry. Chocolate is a mixture between cocoa liquor, cocoa butter, sugar, and other ingredients depending on the recipe of each producer. Furthermore, Cocoa shells and cocoa leaves are also a food source for goats, cows, and rabbits. Currently, on a global market, cocoa supply sources are becoming scarce and expensive. Meanwhile, the global consumption demand for cocoa is still increasing, leading to a situation where supply cannot meet with demand, especially in countries like Russia, China, Ukraine, and the Middle East. That is why cocoa price on the global market in recent years has been increasing and remains stable. This is an opportunity for us to develop new cocoa planting area and increase cocoa production yield. In reality, Vietnam's cocoa planting area has been growing non-stop and is gradually becoming a main crop that brings economic benefits to farmers. To help farmers cultivate cocoa to its maximum efficiency, we would like to provide fellow farmers with the following crucial techniques in cocoa planting and cultivation. Shading for cocoa is a key factor that will ultimately define success in the establishment stage. It is imperative that if shading is not guaranteed, cocoa should not be planted. The main purpose of shading is to reduce the intensity of direct sunlight, which is not suitable for the process of photosynthesis in cocoa, to avoid the leaves and young branches from being sunburnt, and to reduce sudden humidity changes in the air and in the soil surrounding the cocoa plant. Shade trees must be planted before or right when cocoa is planted. Suitable shade trees must meet the following requirements. Shade trees must grow fast, have thin but evenly distributed canopies, have economic values, does not share pests and diseases with cocoa, and provide minimal nutritional competition with cocoa. However, there are few plants in nature that will comply with all these requirements. Therefore, to meet with all the technical requirements for cocoa, the farmer must act accordingly, depending on the characteristics of each plant. Shade trees for cocoa have two categories, temporary shade trees and permanent shade trees. Temporary shade trees are fast-growing trees like Cotalaria, Banana, and Lucina. These trees will be chopped down or die out when cocoa are fully grown. Permanent shade trees are trees planted along with cocoa and will exist for the duration of the cocoa's lifespan. Permanent shade trees can be lucina, coconut, durian, forest trees with thin canopies like hopera, odorata, neem tree, and cassia. Permanent shade trees need to be planted before or intercropped in areas with already established shading like coconut plantations, cashew, durian, or forest pruned to thin density. In the case that permanent shade trees are not yet established, it is necessary to use temporary shade trees or alternative shading methods for the duration it takes for the shade trees to establish. Cocoa leaves have large blades and long petiole which makes them easily broken when swayed or scratched in strong and extended winds, causing the cocoa trees to be stunted and grow slow. Frequent strong wind will twist the cocoa's canopies, making it difficult for architecture control. In cocoa growing areas with strong wind, wind breaking is an ever more important part. Trees that are used for wind breaking are trees with tall trunks and deep roots to prevent falling in strong winds, have large canopies and are economically beneficial. The most common wind breaker used in western highlands is cassia. However, other trees like jackfruit, mango, lucina, acacia, 
rubber, can all be used to establish wind-breaking barriers. Tall stem grass and cotalaria grown in rows are effective at wind-breaking at low height while providing shade during the establishment stage. Cocoa is an industrial perennial crop. Therefore, planting material selection is very important. If we are wrong in the planting material selection process, we will lose many years worth of time and energy fixing this mistake. For that reason, planting material selection is always the most long-term impacting decision. Cocoa is a pollinating crop, so we should have at least five clones in the plantation. When there are many clones of cocoa in the plantation, the rate of pollination increase and so will the rate of pod bearing. Even so, the rate of distribution between the clones in a plantation does not have to be even. Currently, in the highlands or in area where water access is difficult, we should use a lot of TD6. TD6 has the characteristic of withstanding drought, large pods with good yield. TD6 is also especially resistant to VSD, a very dangerous disease on cocoa. Besides TD6, we should also use a lot of TD8. TD8 has thin pod shells, large beans, and high yield. Then there's TD9. The pods are large and so are the beans. TD9 also has a reasonable size canopy. TD9 usually have a slow development rate. Therefore, we don't have to spend a lot of effort on pruning. TD3 is also a very suitable clone for various plantations. Although TD3 has small pods, the beans are large, gives high yield, and bear pods very early. As for TD5, we should limit the number of TD5 because even though TD5 has high yield, tree development is very strong so we will have to spend a lot of effort on pruning. TD5 is also susceptible to black pod and stem canker. Other breeds that the Ministry of Agriculture has approved includes TD10, TD7, TD2 are also very suitable for mixing up diversity in the plantation. Cocoa farmers must take note that they should not use seeds for planting, even if taken from high-yield commercial clones. Cocoa is a pollinating crop, therefore the F1 generation will segregate from the parent. We cannot predict the yield or the quality, and so making it impossible to control the yield or quality of the next generation. Clones have the advantage of having high uniform quality and yield. Furthermore, clones have higher yield and certain clones have high resistance against pests and diseases like VSD. If we want cocoa to develop and grow well, seedling quality selection takes up the most important role after clone selection. A seedling that is up to standard for planting must meet the following criteria. The height from the grafting point to the top is at least 25 centimeters, regardless of top grafting or side grafting. The trunk diameter must be at least 4 millimeters and above. All the leaves must be well and healthy with no signs of pests and diseases. Currently, most cocos in plantations are planted at a distance of 3 meters by 3 meters. This distance is reasonable for true seedlings and clones. If planted in higher density, maximum productivity will also be reached faster, but initial capital investment in clones, labor, and architecture control during production stage will be much higher. If cocoa is intercropped, Cocoa's density will depend accordingly on the density and type of pre-existing crop. Usually, when farmers intercrop cocoa with cashew or coconut, the density would be around 400 to 700 trees per hectare. If cocoa is planted in the highlands, holes must be dug. The size of holes will depend on the quality of the soil and the amount of organic fertilizer used. Normally, a planting hole will have the dimensions of 50 cm by 50 cm by 50 cm. However, regions in the Mekong Delta like Bên Tre or Cần Thơ, where sea levels is high and water table is heavily affected by the tide, cocoa must be planted at ground level or on mounds instead of in holes. Before planting in new areas or new forests where termites reside, planting holes must be treated with pesticides beforehand. 
Pesticides are sprayed in the bottom and around the sides of the hole before lowering the plant. To prepare for cocoa planting, we must dig holes. The most suitable size holes for cocoa are also similar to coffee. During the process of digging holes, we separate the top soil, rich in organic matter and nutrients, to the side. Base fertilizer for each hole includes 50 grams of phosphate spread evenly on the top soil. Then we add 5 to 10 kilograms of composed manure for each hole. We should also add about 300 to 500 agricultural lime for each hole. After mixing well the mixture of manure, surface soil, lime and phosphate, we return this mixture back to the pit until about one month before planting the cocoa tree. Before placing the mixture into the planting hole, we need to break down the walls around the hole. Before planting, we need to cut the bottom of the bag and crooked roots with a sharp knife. Cut lightly along the length of the cocoa seedling bag. Place the entire bag of soil with the bottom cut into the hole and cover up the surrounding base with soil. Press the soil lightly and slowly pull the plastic bag out of the soil mass. In areas with extended drought, the top of the soil bags need to be placed 7 to 10 centimeters below the soil surface. After planting, we will also need to spray pesticide on the surface soil around the planting area and all over the tree trunk. This way, not only will we prevent termites, but also other pests that sting and eat the leaves. After planting the cocoa tree, we need to use organic matters like dried leaves, branches, and cover the roots to keep the soil maintained at an appropriate moisture content for the trees to grow while also reducing evaporation. Furthermore, base covering also serves the purpose of preventing dirt from slashing onto the leaves during rain, spreading diseases caused by the fungus Phytophthora. However, when covering the tree's base, it must be noted that we should not cover too close to the trunk, which might lead to too high humidity, making the trunk easily be infected by diseases. After planting, if there are short drought periods, irrigation is necessary for new roots to develop and for the tree to recover its full growing capability. During the seedling stage, the cocoa tree only needs 25 to 50 percent direct sunlight, which is why we need to provide proper shading for it to develop properly. We can use any material to provide shading for the plant, for example, shade cloth, hay, or different types of grasses. We need to maintain this shade until the temporary or permanent shade trees are providing sufficient shading for the cocoa. Furthermore, after planting, we need to keep the plant stem straight and regularly prune the lower branch buds. When participating in a UTZ certified program, farmers will need to take note of the following. 1. Do not cut down forests to grow cocoa. 2. When growing cocoa in a reservation area, the management of the reservation must be notified. 3. When growing cocoa on a sloped area, erosion prevention methods must be taken like growing shade trees, making terraces and reservoirs to prevent erosion and covering bases. 4. Practice cultivation methods that preserve the environment like not using too much synthesized fertilizer, constantly practicing methods to increase soil humus. Cocoa needs a lot of irrigation during the dry season and through persistent small droughts during the rainy season. With enough water, flowers will bloom more, pods will have good bean size, and the tree will be healthier. However, cocoa is a crop that cannot tolerate being waterlogged. Therefore, in the rainy season, there needs to be a good drainage system to limit the diseases in the roots and reduce the harm from Phytophthora. During the dry season of the new planting year, we should water the cocoa trees to help them grow and develop well. The amount of water irrigated changes depending on the method of irrigation, type of soil, and technique of cultivation. In this stage, because the root system has not yet thrived, each irrigation session only needs to focus on the root area. In sandy soil, the time gap between irrigation is shorter compared to basan soil or clay soil. To increase water use efficiency and reduce the number of irrigation times, in the case of direct irrigation with rubber hose, set up reservoirs to contain water. On top of that, cocoa tree's base needs to be covered well during the dry season to reduce water evaporation and limit sudden changes in temperature. When irrigating infant cocoa trees, we do not point the hose directly at the base to prevent erosion from injuring the tree's roots. 
If we can combine irrigation with fertilizing, then we only need to provide sufficient moisture in areas where the roots are growing. Do not let water overflow the basin of the tree or too much water will spill out of the vertical root system. In this stage, we need to irrigate with the amount of 50 to 100 liters per tree per session. Period of irrigation is every 10 to 15 days. When cocoa approaches production stage, irrigation amount needs to be increased to 150 to 200 liters per tree per session. Period of irrigation is every 15 to 20 days. The plantation needs to guarantee shading and surface coverage to limit water evaporation during the dry season. The source of water for irrigation can come from rivers, lakes, or wells that are not contaminated by salt or low pH. Right now, there are many methods to irrigate cocoa, such as sprinkler irrigation, drip irrigation, and hose irrigation. During the establishment stage, we can use sprinkler irrigation. However, when the trees are in production stage and the amount of pods and flowers are plenty, we apply hose irrigation or drip irrigation. With hose irrigation, we can use different types of motor pump. Drip irrigation is used widely in the southeast and southwest of Vietnam. Traditional irrigation method by direct water hose has many disadvantages like wasting water due to overflow, evaporation by sunlight and wind, water absorption in areas without roots, requiring high pressure in order to pump water. On top of that, it requires much labor to drag the hoses and build a reservoir. With drip irrigation, Water will soak gradually into the soil and straight to the root system. It does not waste water and does not irrigate in non-growth areas. Since water is only irrigated in areas where there are roots, the amount of water required is much lower but still maintaining sufficient soil moisture. Less water is also lost due to sunlight and wind. Through drip irrigation, the water flow is low and extremely efficient, which allows for irrigation on a much larger area compared to traditional methods. Also through drip irrigation, fertilizer can be regularly supplied to the trees in small amounts so efficiency of use is also extremely high. In the dry season, the amount of cocoa pods on the trees are still plenty. That is why we must increase the amount of fertilizer during each irrigation session so that the cocoa beans will be large and firm. It will also guarantee that the amount of sustenance in the tree is 